Welcome to Listworthy's summary explanation of the Hostel Horror Movie series. The first movie introduces us to three friends, Paxton, Josh, and Ollie, who are traveling across Europe, determined to do nothing but get high, go clubbing, and have a lot of random hookups. In the Netherlands, they visit an Amsterdam nightclub where they get kicked out after getting into a fight and then later a brothel. When the three get back to their hostel, they are not able to get back in because of a curfew. They make a huge ruckus outside the hostel and they wake up a lot of people who are angry and are told to F off. A man named Alexi invites them to stay in his apartment for the night and the four start talking. Paxton and Josh tell him about their plans to hook up with hot women in Barcelona where Josh's friend is expecting them. Alexi recommends that instead of going to Barcelona, they should visit a certain hostel in Slovakia which is filled with beautiful and desperate women who will definitely hook up with them. Josh tries to look up the hostel in his guidebook but Alexi tells him it is not found in guidebooks. If that's not a red flag, I don't know what is. The three friends, eager to hook up with a lot of girls, don't find it suspicious at all that a random stranger talked them into changing their travel plans and visiting a random Slovakian hostel. So the next day, they hop on a train going to Slovakia to pursue their hedonistic fantasy. On the train, they meet a Dutch businessman who chats with them briefly, shows them a picture of his cute kid and generally seems friendly enough. However, when the Dutch businessman hits on Josh and touches his leg, Josh yells at him, causing him to leave, looking slightly embarrassed. Arriving in Slovakia, they find that their roommates in the hostel are two women, Natalia and Svetlana, who are super flirty and invite them to the spa. So far, the hostel seems to be everything Alexi promised it would be. Ollie, Josh, Paxton and the girls go to a disco. Josh, who is bothered by Svetlana's smoking, steps outside of the disco briefly for some fresh air. He has a run-in with a gang of local criminal kids who demand cigarettes. When Josh, who doesn't have any cigarettes on him, doesn't give in to their demands, they look ready to physically hurt him, maybe even kill him. But luckily, the Dutch businessman from the train shows up to defend him and gives the kids what they want. Grateful, Josh buys him a beer and apologizes for his reaction on the train. The Dutchman accepts Josh's apology graciously and leaves him to have fun with his friends. Paxton and Josh leave with Natalia and Svetlana and later have sex with them, while Ollie leaves with Vala, the woman from the hostel front desk. The next morning, Josh and Paxton look for Ollie, who never returned, but the desk clerk tells them Ollie checked out. This is very suspicious because Ollie left his friends without so much as a note or a text message. Paxton tries to get a hold of Ollie, but he doesn't answer his phone. Whilst bidding farewell to Natalia, Josh and Paxton are approached by an Asian girl named Kana who is also staying at the hostel with her friend Yuki. Kana shows them a photo of Ollie and her friend Yuki who is also mysteriously missing. From the photo that was sent to Kana's phone, it seems like Yuki and Ollie left together. But Paxton doesn't understand how Ollie could have left with Yuki because he doesn't even like Asian girls. But he eventually accepts that Ollie simply dished them. But things are far from being how they seem because elsewhere, and unbeknownst to their friends, Ollie has been decapitated while Yuki is being tortured. Josh wants to leave Slovakia, but Paxton convinces him to stay one more night with Natalia and Svetlana. While they are clubbing, both women slip Josh and Paxton some tranquilizers. Josh feels sick, so he dizzily stumbles back to the hostel, where the woman at the front desk, after helping him to his bed, lets some man into his room. Whatever is going on at this hostel, it seems the front desk people, as well as Natalia and Svetlana, are in on it. Back at the club, also feeling sick, Paxton goes to the bathroom, but he accidentally ends up locked in a pantry. He tries to call for help, but nobody can hear him over the loud music. Josh wakes up handcuffed and chained to a chair in a dungeon-like room. A man in a mask starts to torture him by drilling holes in his chest and legs. When he is done drilling, he takes off his mask and lo and behold, it's the Dutch businessman. Josh is surprised and horrified and he is forced to listen to the Dutchman as he talks about all his dreams. 
The Dutchman tells Josh that he had wanted to be a surgeon when he was younger, but was rejected by the medical board due to a condition he has that causes his hands to shake. So what he is doing to Josh is some sort of sick, twisted surgeon torture fantasy he is fulfilling. Josh begs to be let go. The Dutchman slices his Achilles tendons and unchains him, baiting him to leave, but Josh is unable to reach the door. The Dutchman drags Josh back, who in desperation offers to pay the Dutchman whatever he wants in exchange for letting him go. The Dutchman isn't interested in Josh's money, however, and reveals that in fact, he paid people for the chance to live his torture fantasy. After this revelation, the Dutchman slits Josh's throat with a scalpel. Parkstone wakes up at the disco the next morning and is kicked out by the staff. When he returns to the hostel, he learns that he supposedly checked out. So after clearing up the mix-up, he is given a new room where he is greeted by two women who invite him to the spa. This is very strange and hella suspicious because this is the same exact thing Natalia and Svetlana did and said when Josh and Paxton first arrived at the hostel. The girls even come in the same format of a blonde and a brunette. Suspicious, Paxton goes out to look for Josh and tries to call him, but his cell phone gets stolen by the criminal gang of children from earlier. Paxton goes to the police to try and report Josh as missing, but they are not very helpful but they do say that they will look out for him. Paxton locates Natalia and Svetlana and demands that they tell him where Josh is. The two tell him that Josh went to an art exhibit. Natalia takes Paxton to an old factory where the alleged art exhibit is taking place. As they are walking down the dark dingy halls of the old factory, Paxton sees Josh's mutilated corpse being stitched back together by the Dutchman in one of the rooms. He realizes too late that Natalia lured him into a trap when two men drag him down a hallway, passing by several rooms where other people are being tortured. But before Paxton was dragged away, Natalia took a moment to tell Paxton that she got a lot of money for him, and then mocks and laughs at him. Paxton is restrained in a chair and prepped to be tortured by a German client named Johann. Paxton attempts to plead with Johan by speaking German, but Johan is not moved, he is annoyed. He smacks Paxton in the face and has one of the factory goons place a ball gag in his mouth. When the German pulls out a chainsaw, Paxton is so scared he vomits. The German, probably fearing that Paxton will choke on his own vomit and die before he tortures him, removes the ball gag from his mouth. While cutting off Paxton's fingers with a chainsaw, Johan the German unintentionally severs his restraints. Coming at Paxton again, he accidentally slips on the ball gag that was discarded on the floor and falls on his back, losing control of the chainsaw and cutting off his own leg. Paxton breaks free from the chair and reaches for the gun Johan had in the room and shoots him in the head. Paxton hides in another room, full of dead bodies, when he hears other guards passing. He hides under one of the corpses and is carted off to a room where the bodies are cremated. He manages to sneak away and finds the elevator to the top floor, where he changes into business clothes and finds a card for the elite hunting club in the jacket, an organization that allows rich people to pay to kill, torture and mutilate tourists. Disguised as a paying customer of the elite hunting club, he ends up having a one-sided conversation with Louis Litt, another club member who is super pumped to get his murder and torturing on. After meeting Louis the psychopath, Paxton is now extra desperate to escape the factory. He manages to get to a car that conveniently has keys in the ignition, but before he can make his escape, he hears Kana, the Asian girl from the hostel, screaming. He tracks her down to one of the rooms and finds Louis torturing her by burning her face with a blowtorch. He shoots Louis dead and makes a run for it with Connor. As he drives off, he spots Natalia, Svetlana and Alexei, the guy in Amsterdam who recommended the hostel together. He runs over all three of them. Svetlana and Alexei are instantly killed, but Natalia he has to run over twice when he sees her still alive. While driving, Paxton encounters the criminal gang of children and gives them candy. Hot in pursuit of Paxton and Kana are the goons from the elite hunting club who also encounter the children, 
but they make the mistake of shouting at them and not paying the candy tax, so the kids attack them and kill them with concrete bricks. When Paxton and Kana get to the train station, Kana catches a glimpse of herself in the mirror and is super bummed about having a disfigured face. So she commits suicide by jumping in front of a moving train. While riding the train, Paxton spots the Dutch businessman who killed Josh. When they reach a stop in Vienna, Paxton sneaks up on the Dutchman while he is in a public toilet with his pants down and kills him. When he gets that done, he hops back onto the train and goes on his merry way. And that is how the first movie ends. In Hostel 2, we get to see Paxton's ultimate fate. Paxton was found passed out on the train and taken to a hospital. The police pay him a visit and he tells them everything he knows about the elite hunting club, the hostel and the murders. The police then attack and stab him. At this point, Paxton then wakes up gasping in his bed. Turns out, he never reported the elite hunting club to the police in real life, and he never told Josh's mother that her son is dead. She still thinks her son is in Europe. Paxton is convinced the elite hunting club will eventually come after him. He suffers from PTSD and lives in seclusion with his girlfriend Stephanie. After an argument, Stephanie denounces Paxton as paranoid and insufferable, but as it turns out, Paxton was right to be paranoid because the next morning, Stephanie wakes up to find his headless corpse in their kitchen. While somewhere in Europe, in an unmarked box, his severed head is delivered to a man in a suit. The movie then focuses its attention on a new group of friends. This time they are girls in Rome. American art students Beth, Whitney and Lorna. They meet this girl named Axel, a nude model they were sketching in their art class. Axel invites Beth for some drinks, but Beth turns her down as she and her friends have to catch a train to Prague. On the train to Prague, Whitney and Beth spot Axel again. Anyway, Beth and Whitney meet this random guy on the train, who at first seems charming, but when they follow him back to his train car, thinking he has drugs, he and his friends immediately start to give off rapey a-hole vibes. When they decide to leave, the men insult them, call them teasers, and they threaten to find them, as it is a long train ride. Back in their train car, Beth and Whitney find a distraught and crying Lorna who informs them that some weirdo robbed them. Axel the nude model conveniently shows up at that very moment and returns her iPod. She claims she saw a guy run out of their train car, he tried to rob her too, but she fought him off and he dropped the iPod as he ran off. Having successfully insinuated herself into the girls' confidence after returning the iPod, Axel is invited to hang out with them in their train car. As the girls talk, Axel tells them about a luxury spa she is going to in Slovakia. She does a really good job of selling it to the American girls by mentioning the natural hot springs there. Since the girls trust Axel, they accept her invitation to go to Slovakia with her and they completely change their travel plans. When they get to the hostel they will be staying at, the guy at the front desk is the same guy from the first movie. The evil little weasel is still helping lure unsuspecting tourists to the hostel. As the girls are at the desk, Victor Krum also checks into the hostel but he is going by the name Miroslav these days. Later, the little weasel desk clerk uploads Lorna, Whitney and Beth's passports onto an auction website. Several businessmen get alerts on their phones and computers, and a bidding war commences. The guy who wins the bid on Whitney and Beth is an American businessman named Todd and his best friend Stuart, who immediately travel to Slovakia. The girls explore the village and later in the evening at the Harvest Festival, Whitney reveals to Lorna that Beth's mother left her a ton of money when she died and that Beth is pretty much rich enough to buy all of Slovakia. Elsewhere, at the Elite Hunting Club Lodge, Todd gets a tattoo on his arm that marks him as an official member, but his friend Stuart doesn't want to do it because he hates needles. Todd then pushes and bullies his friend into getting the tattoo because he thinks it's cool, but also because it is mandatory that all Elite Hunting Club members get one and these people do not F around with their rules. 
So Stuart ends up getting the tattoo. After the whole tattoo business is over and done with, Stuart and Todd attend the Harvest Festival. When Todd sees Beth, he remarks that she is a dead ringer for her, and by her, he means Stuart's wife, who looks a lot like Beth. Stuart approaches Beth, and the two share a friendly conversation after Beth accidentally spills her drink on him. When they part, he is like, goodbye, Beth. Beth gives him a weird look because she knows she did not tell him her name, but he explains it away by saying that he heard her friend say her name and she buys his story. Meanwhile, Lorna, sweet, sensitive Lorna, gets charmed by a local man named Roman who asks her to dance and then later offers to take her on a boat ride. Beth wisely tells her not to go on a boat ride with this stranger, but as soon as she turns her back, Lorna foolishly discards her warning and goes on a midnight boat ride with Roman. Roman lures her to a secluded place where two goons appear to back him up. Then they attack and knock out Lorna. Back at the festival, Whitney is drunk as hell and stumbling all over herself. Beth, being a good friend, doesn't want to leave her in the care of Victor Kroom, so they leave the festival together and head back to the hostel while Axel volunteers to wait for Lorna. The next day during a jog, Todd goes off at Stuart for his lack of excitement at the opportunity to kill someone, but Stuart weakly reassures him that he is up for it and all the way in. Meanwhile, as Whitney, Beth, Axel and Victor Kroom relax at the hot springs, Lorna wakes up naked, gagged, and hung upside down above a bathtub. A woman enters the room and slashes at her with a scythe to collect her blood in the bathtub. She then bathes in the blood before killing Lorna by slashing her throat. I guess the fantasy she paid for wasn't just to murder a person, but to also bathe in the blood of an innocent young woman. At the springs, Beth dozes off and wakes up alone. When she goes to retrieve her things, she finds her locker broken into and her clothes missing. She tries to find her friends, but when she goes back to the springs, she is pursued by several men, so she flees the spa. While running into the woods, she trips and is ambushed by the local criminal gang of children who assault her with sticks. She is saved by Axel and the man who ordered Paxton's beheading, Sasha, who is the elite hunting club boss. As Axel takes Beth to the car, Sasha executes one of the boys from the gang as punishment. Later, at Sasha's mansion, Sasha and Axel do their best to put Beth at ease, telling her that the police are on their way to take her statement and that they are already looking for her friends. She is given some clothes and encouraged to take a nap before the police arrive. But when she is left alone in the bedroom and looks out the window, she sees the men who were pursuing her from earlier arrive and realizes that the men are in cahoots with Sasha and Axel. She barricades herself in the bedroom and hides in a closet, but as she retreats deeper into it, she discovers a room filled with human trophy heads, one of which is Paxton's. Beth is captured and taken to the abandoned factory and tied up in a room. Beth is soon joined by Stuart, who is supposed to kill her. It turns out Todd is the wealthy one, not Stuart, and he paid for Beth for Stuart. Stuart, who has been having second thoughts for a while now, unties Beth, explains the situation to her, and says he is not a monster. Beth goes to the door to try to leave, but someone knocks her out. In another room, Todd terrorizes Whitney with a power saw, but he loses his nerve after he accidentally scalps her. He is not as hardcore as he thought he was, and is terribly horrified by what he has done. He tries to leave, but is informed that he has to kill Whitney to leave. It is all part of the contract and everything. When Todd refuses to kill Whitney, the guards unleash several dogs which maul him to death. It turns out, of the two guys, Stuart is the real sadist, not Todd, even though Todd is the one who paid for the experience. Stuart is the one who knocked out Beth and he sheds his nice guy persona completely, fully intent on torturing and killing Beth. He reveals that Beth bears an extremely close resemblance to his wife, 
whom he hates but cannot kill because he would be the prime suspect. Stuart then begins to berate Beth. With Todd now dead, the elite hunting club offers a maimed Whitney to other clients to kill, including an Italian man who is eating Victor Krum alive. Stuart, after discovering Todd's death, shows Beth pictures of a maimed Whitney to frighten and torment her. He accepts the club's offer and then heads off to behead Whitney. When he returns to Beth, he puts Whitney's bloody necklace around her neck. When Stuart starts ranting at her like she is his wife, Beth seduces him by telling him that his wife doesn't understand him. She flatters his ego and gets him to untie her. Stuart attempts to rape her. Beth at first pretends to be into it, but she blindsides him a moment later and headbutts him real hard. She picks up a metal rod and beats him with it before finally chaining him to the chair she was previously occupying. She breaks the cameras in the room so the guards can't see her. She asks Stuart what the code to the door is, but he is uncooperative, so she tortures the information out of him. Stuart lies to her and gives her the wrong code, which doesn't open the door, but instead alerts the guards of her attempt at escape. The guards arrive with dogs, and she gets into a bit of a standoff with them as she wields a gun at them while simultaneously threatening to cut off Stuart's junk. Sasha shows up and Beth offers to buy her freedom using part of her vast fortune. Sasha, despite Stuart's protest, is first and foremost a businessman and is amenable to Beth's offer. Stuart tries to make a counter offer and outbid Beth, but Sasha reveals that he knows that Stuart cannot afford to do so. Sasha tells Beth that in order to leave, she must also kill someone. Stuart, the dumbass, chooses this exact moment to insult and enrage Beth, so she cuts off his genitals and leaves him to bleed to death. Satisfied, Sasha gives Beth an elite hunting club tattoo, making her an official member. That very night, Axel, who has lured a new group of tourists to the village festival, gets her purse stolen by a child from the criminal gang. She pursues the kid into the woods, but this was a trap set up by the gang of children. They, along with a newly freed Beth, ambush her, and Beth beheads her. Which is kind of poetic because Beth's best friend Whitney also lost her life by beheading. Shortly after, the children start playing football with Axel's severed head, and that is how Hostel 2 ends. Hostel 3 begins with a dorky looking young man named Travis, walking into a hostel occupied by a Ukrainian couple, Victor and Anka. There seems to be some sort of mix-up because Victor and Anka weren't supposed to be occupying the room. The couple invites Travis inside and are really friendly. The suspiciously friendly couple offers Travis a drink, but the awkward Travis turns them down, saying he brought his own drinks. He pulls a six-pack of beer out of his backpack and shares it with the couple. Anka leaves the room to go take a shower while Victor tells Travis about a club with beautiful women he should visit. In the shower, Victor finds that Anka has fallen unconscious. He shouts for Travis to call a doctor, but Travis just stands there watching and helpfully. A few moments later, Victor too falls unconscious. Travis the dark drugged the beer he gave them. Travis then makes a call and some goons show up to put the couple in body bags. Travis then rolls up his sleeve and reveals the elite hunting club tattoo on his arm. He is one of the bad guys. Victor later wakes up in a cell in an abandoned building and watches as two guards drag Anka out of her cell. The story then shifts to a guy named Scott, who leaves his fiancée Amy to go to Palm Springs with his friend Carter for Scott's bachelor party where they will be mostly golfing. As soon as Scott gets into Carter's car, Carter informs Scott that they are not going golfing in Palm Springs, they are going to Las Vegas. Scott is a little surprised at the change of plans, but he is down to party in Las Vegas. When they get to Vegas, they meet up with their other friends, Mike and Justin. The four go to a casino with pro dancers where they meet Kendra and Nikki, two escorts Carter secretly paid to sleep with Scott. Kendra and Nikki tell the four men about a freaky party they could go to on the other end of town and the four take a cab to an abandoned building. 
When they enter the building, there is not a sign of life anywhere, so they start to wander the empty halls for a bit, looking for the party. Just then, Amy calls Scott to check up on him. As Scott speaks to Amy, his friends continue to wander the halls. By the time Scott gets off the phone, it's like his friends have disappeared into thin air. He calls out for them and searches the building for them, but he can't find them. Then out of nowhere, he is ambushed, a bag is thrown over his head and his hands and feet are strapped to a wheelchair. He is taken to another room where a tube of beer is forced into his mouth. The bag over his head is then removed and the lights come on. Turns out, his kidnapping was staged by his friends who threw him a surprise bachelor party complete with loud music and a lap dancer. Scott takes it all in stride and starts to party with his friends. At the party, Kendra and Scott go to a private room where Kendra makes a move on Scott. But he turns her down gently and tells her about how he previously cheated on Amy and almost lost her and does not want it to happen again. Mike and Nikki show up to hang out, but Scott feels sick, so he stumbles out for some fresh air. When he gets outside, he throws up, makes some awkward eye contact with the cabbie who drove him to the club and tries to get back inside the building. He tries banging on the building to the club, but it's locked and he can't get back inside. He sees the cabbie start to approach him before promptly passing out. Scott wakes up the next morning in his hotel room with Carter and Justin. When asked how he got back to the hotel, Scott realizes that the scary cabbie is the one who drove him back to his hotel. Mike is missing from the group and the three wonder where Mike is as he is not answering his phone. Elsewhere, Mike awakens in a cell and starts panicking and shouting, demanding to know what is going on. When two guards come to get him, he struggles against them, but they tase and subdue him. He gets strapped to a chair in an empty room with one wall made of glass. This is because Mike is put on display to be gambled upon by wealthy clients. A man enters the room. Mike pleads and cries to be let go, but the man ignores him and peels off his face with a scalpel in front of an audience of other clients. Afterwards, his face is put on a mannequin head. Hours go by and Mike still doesn't show up. Justin remembers that Nikki gave him her card, so the three track down her trailer to ask her if she knows where Mike is as she was the last person seen with him. They break into her trailer when she doesn't answer the door. Inside the trailer, there is no sign of her or Mike. As they are searching Nikki's trailer for clues, Kendra and another man show up with guns and demand to know why they broke into Nikki's trailer. Scott explains that they are looking for their friend Mike. Kendra reveals that Nikki can't help them because she is missing as well. Meanwhile, back at the Las Vegas branch of the elite hunting club, Nikki is forced to dress up like a cheerleader, strapped to a table, and then brought into the same room as Mike. Just like Mike, her torture will be on display to other clients. Another man enters the room and releases a jar full of cockroaches onto Nikki, which crawl into her mouth and suffocate her to death as she screams. Scott, Justin, Carter and Kendra look for Nikki and Mike at the club they visited. But before they enter, Justin gets a text from Mike's phone sent by Travis to meet him and Nikki at a hostel. Along with the text, Justin gets an accompanying photo of the seemingly asleep Nikki. When they get to the hostel, everyone is kidnapped by Travis, even Justin, who stayed back in the car, is taken. Later, they all wake up in individual cells next to Victor. After two guards take Justin away, Carter calls one of the guards and shows him his elite hunting club tattoo. Having proven that he is a member, the guards let him go. He goes to see Fleming, the boss of the Las Vegas branch of the elite hunting club. As he and Carter talk, it becomes clear that Carter had arranged for only Scott to be taken, but things got screwed up somehow and everyone got taken. Fleming tells Carter that his other friends cannot be allowed to just go. Now that the club has got them, they are not giving them back. 
Carter is cool with this. He even remarks that they were always more Scott's friends than his. In the murder room, Justin is strapped into a chair. A woman dressed in all leather and a mask then begins to shoot him with multiple crossbows as Carter and the other members of the elite hunting club watch. With Justin dead, it is now Scott's turn in the murder room. He is announced as the main event and strapped to a chair. When Carter emerges to kill him, Scott demands to know why Carter is doing what he is doing and Carter reveals he wants Amy for himself as they were in a relationship before she ended up with Scott. Carter says he was disappointed that Amy stayed with Scott even after Carter told her about Scott's infidelity. He says that once Scott dies, he will comfort Amy and she will want to be with him. Carter picks up a chainsaw and wants to put on a big show of killing Scott for the other elite club members, but Fleming screws Carter over and orders Scott to be let go from the chair. Scott and Carter start fighting and Carter, who has all the strength of a baby weasel, is easily overpowered by Scott after a short tussle. The club members cheer wildly at this and immediately start a bidding war over who gets to kill Scott. Scott ends up stabbing Carter, cuts off Carter's tattoo and then escapes by using Carter's tattoo on the scanners. Back at the cells, Victor kills one of the guards and frees himself. After cutting off the building's power, Victor is found by another guard whom he stabs with an axe. But before dying, the guard shoots Victor dead. Scott calls the police and frees Kendra, but she is shot a second later by Travis. Travis and Scott get into a fight, but Scott wins it when he chops off Travis's hand and beats him to death with Justin's crutch. After Fleming orders all of the prisoners to be killed, he sets the building to explode and attempts to drive away, but Carter, who is surprisingly still alive after being stabbed multiple times, was hiding in the back seat and ambushes Fleming. He is pissed because Fleming betrayed him, so he stabs him to death and takes his car. Carter sees Scott and locks the front gate before Scott can get to him. He then quickly drives off while the building explodes, with Scott still inside the gates. Some time later, Carter is comforting a grieving Amy in her house. Amy invites him to stay the night, and everything seems to be going exactly as Carter planned. But when he sits down to have dinner with Amy, she reveals that Scott is still alive and pins Carter's hand to a chair with a corkscrew. A burnt Scott appears, and the pair tie up Carter in Amy's garage, where Scott kills him with a lightweight gas-powered tiller. And that is how the Hostel movie series ends. I give Hostel 1, 2, and 3 watchability ratings of 8 out of 10, 8.5 out of 10, and 6.5 out of 10 respectively, and an overall movie series watchability rating of 7.6 out of 10. I rated the third movie the lowest because it switched the location of the elite hunting club from Slovakia to Las Vegas, which I didn't like, and also because it lacked that special Eli Roth touch. I rated the second movie the highest because it had the most satisfying ending, and a hero, or rather heroine, I liked and could root for. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the subscribe button, leave a like, and check out some of my other content.